So just to give you a layout of today's panel discussion and presentation on subcontracting, uh, Deb, Deborah Crumity, my colleague, uh, she is a commercial uh, market representative out of a, well, government contracting office, the SBA government contracting office area four, which includes Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, West Virginia. Uh, I'm sure I'm meeting the Minnesota, I'm leaving some off, but uh, I'm very happy to have her uh, partnering with us today. And uh, Tom Kruzmark, who is the deputy area director of the Office of Government Contracting for SBA, he is also on today. Uh, and we also have Stephanie Lewis. Uh, she is going to be giving a presentation on subcontracting. She is an SBA program manager uh, with subcontracting. Uh, so in addition to uh, the SBA's presence, we also have a lot of PTAC uh, counselors, uh, the PTAC program manager. Uh, so, and then we have our primes, which have been a real pleasure to work with. Uh, we have Cummins Inc., uh, we have AEP, uh, we have Rolls-Royce, and we have Eagle Pitcher. So uh, we do have uh, questions that we have come up with, but there will be time for you and the audience to ask our prime contractor panelist questions as well. If you can just put it into the chat, I will be monitoring the chat. Uh, so I will interject a question or, or uh, I'll try not to you know, get mid sentence of our panelists, but we'll see uh, how it goes, but it's worked out pretty well so far. So Helena, I think the my, your presentation may have just arrived. I heard a text message go through, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Deborah at this point, and uh, she is going to be moderating. Uh, the session today. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, move your camera down a little bit. Can you see me? Now I can't, I can't see my yeah, I can't see my camera. I apologize. Now I can so. see here up. Yeah, there I can You're see good. my camera. How's that? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to turn my camera back off anyway when the presenter's gone. But okay. um, what I want to thank you for always um, inviting the SBA government contracting area for to these wonderful events. And like you said, we do have an awesome panel today. And first, I would like to start out with introductions. And just so you're aware, introductions are not in no specific order. But I think to keep things flowing, we will um, possibly introduce panelists um, as I speak. But to start out, I would like to introduce the uh, SBA resource partner, and that's the PTAC. And um, I'll turn it over to PTAC. Good morning. Thank you, Deborah. My name is Jane Stewart, and I'm the Associate Director of the Ohio University PTAC. PTAC is a federally funded program. We are funded by the Department of Defense, the Ohio Department of Development, and Ohio University to provide government contracting assistance to businesses at no cost. Our services include our daily bid matching, where we can help companies to locate opportunity. Then we can assist with the bidding or proposal process. We can also help with getting registered in SAM, which is a requirement for all government contracting on a federal level. <clears throat> and many prime contractors also require a SAM registration. A very important marketing tool when you are meeting with prime contractors and government agencies is a capability statement. We can assist you in creating a, an effective capability statement that identifies your company. It's basically a one-page resume of who you are, what you do, how you do it, why you're awesome, and why, why I should do business with you. I'm going to put the link to the PTAC, um, the Ohio PTAC website in the, in the chat. So if you would like to obtain PTAC services, we have a very short client profile form that will give us all the information we need to get you set up in our system. And with that, um, if you have any questions, again, please put them in the, in the chat 
box and I'd be happy to answer them. We also have Sharon Hopkins on, on the um, webinar with us. Sharon is my director. She's the director of the Ohio University PTAC. We have PTAC offices throughout the state of Ohio, and every state in the country has the PTAC office. So if you're not in Ohio, I will also put the, the link where you so you can locate your local PTAC office. And with that, thank you. I think you're in for a informative session this morning. Thank you. Back to you, Deborah. Okay, Jane, that was great information. We always appreciate our PTACs. Okay, next we will proceed with a um, very important guest, and um, she has been with the SBA for a while, um, and I'll let her give you any additional information. Her name is Ms. Stephanie Lewis, and she is the SBA National Subcontracting Program Manager, and she's going to provide you some wonderful information about the subcontracting program. Stephanie? Good morning, everybody. Let's see. I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to pull up. Super. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. My name is Stephanie Lewis. I work for SBA's Office of Government Contracting. I've uh, worked at SBA 30 years now, starting in the uh, Glendale, California office and then moving over to the Dallas Fort Worth office. <clears throat> and uh, here recently, I've become the subcontracting program manager. And uh, this program focuses on subcontracting not, opportunities not, for so small businesses you actually, can you through uh, prime contractors or lower tier large businesses uh, through their federal subcontracting plans. And um, next slide. In this presentation, I've kind of divided it into three segments. First, I'd like to introduce our CMRs, such as the one that you just met, Deborah Cromedy, throughout the country. And then a little bit about what we do at SBA to promote small businesses uh, for federal subcontracting, and then how to locate, you know, the crux of my presentation, I want to be useful tools for small businesses to how to locate subcontracting opportunities uh, for your business in the future. Next slide. Oh, it, there we go. Um, we have six, we're broken into six area offices in government contracting, and we've sorted out the states per area office. And so the reason that I want to introduce these individuals to you is I know that most of you are probably located in Ohio, but if you have other divisions or uh, friends with businesses, or if you are uh, looking for a particular federal prime contractor in another state, you could perhaps reach out to the other commercial market representative that covers that state. So in each of the um, areas there are in the red print, and then the states that that area covers are right beneath. So in area one, we have uh, two full-time CMRs, Christopher Sal and Jean Spillane. And then we have Melinda Chen and Sandy Liu who also work in the program part-time. Um, in area two, we currently have a vacancy. So if you would just revert back to the area one CMRs, if you need assistance in area two at this time. And in area three, we have Arnett Mayhew and then Gary Hurd is part-time as well. Next slide. Um, area four, we have the great Deborah Cromedy, who covers the state of Ohio. In area five, we have Sophia Chow. And in area six, we have Janice Nietes. Next slide. SBA subcontracting program is uh, serving a lot of customers. Uh, it's kind of a um, integrated program that requires the cooperation and um, effort with a lot of different partners. Um, we work closely with our resource partners, our PTACs, and I'll talk about them in just a little bit. And of course, we work with SBA staff. We have uh, startup programs, score counselors. We have uh, 8A specialists, hub zone staff, the woman owned staff, the service disabled veteran owned staff, and those certification programs as well. Um, we have the prime contractor community that we work with, and then we have the federal acquisition community. 
And so the federal acquisition community releases the, the prime contract and then the prime contractor receives the contract. And in, in our instance, we're most interested in those that are large businesses that receive the prime contract because then we encourage and want those large prime contractors to subcontract to small businesses, because this is where a lot of opportunities lie for small businesses. They may not be able to have the experience or uh, the longevity or the expertise to perform on a federal prime contract that might be multifaceted or very large. And so some of the subcontracting opportunities are gonna be very important to them because they can still be a participant on that contract um, but, but may not be able to be the prime contractor. And that's SBA's focus is getting small businesses to participate at whatever level that they can in federal procuring for federal procurement. And, um, you know, as some while SBA fights um, consolidation and coupling of contracts. Uh, it, it does happen. And so some contracts get very large or some schedules get very large. And so uh, SBA fights to advocate for inclusion of small businesses at all tiers. And sometimes subcontracting is the tier that small businesses have to have entrance at. Next slide. So the way that it works is the, the federal agency, when they release a contract to a large business, which we call it's technically the term is other than small. We have two types of businesses. We have small businesses and then we have other than small. But sometimes we use the term large business instead of other than small because it's just complicated to say other than small. So when a, a federal agency issues a contract over $750,000 or 1.5 million in, in the cases of a construction contract to a large business, it has to have something in that contract called a small business subcontracting plan that it has negotiated with the contracting officer. And in that plan, it has six sets of goals. It has a lot of other things too. It has a lot of actions that the prime contractor has to take in order to carry out a good small business program and uh, promote inclusion of small businesses and subcontracting to what we call the maximum extent practicable. And it has six sets of goals. It has goals to small businesses, to women-owned small businesses, to small disadvantaged businesses, to SBA certified hub zone firms, veteran-owned small businesses, and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so I'm sorry. Can you go back one slide? There we go. So if a if a large business subcontracts to a firm that is a small woman owned veteran owned business, it would count that subcontract in all three categories. And so we what we have is we have a lot of large businesses across the United States, thousands of them that receive federal contracts with subcontracting plans, and each of them have these goals within them. And um, in particular, uh, I wanted to just draw your attention to the, if you're a woman-owned small business, you may have heard of the SBA's Woman-Owned Small Business and Economically Disadvantaged Woman-Owned Small Business Certification Programs. You do not have to receive those certifications to participate as a woman-owned small business in a federal subcontract. Um, but for HubZone, we are only counting HubZone certified firms to count in that category. And, you know, primes struggle a lot with some of these categories. Um, the service disablement and the HubZone categories, for instance, are difficult for them. And there's many times that I've talked to prime contractors and they literally go through every HubZone firm in the dynamic small business search um, to see whether they can use that firm or not at their company somehow, just so that they can get some money going towards hub zone firms. And so they do take a lot of effort to reach out and find companies that qualify, but it's kind of a two way street. You, know, you have to find them and they have to find you, which is kind of where the difficulty lies and part of what we'll talk about here in a little bit. Next slide. So I mentioned that they have a small business subcontracting plan that have those six goals in it, but it also has a couple of other things in the plan. Um, it has, it identifies the types of supplies and services that they're gonna subcontract. It describes 
potential sources for solicitation and what it's going to do to find small businesses. And the things that it lists in the FAR is that it's going to look at its company source list. It's the SAM, Veteran Service, Veteran Service Organizations, Minority Purchasing Council Vendor Information Services, the Minority Business Development Agency at the Department of Commerce, and then uh, trade associations. It's going to name an individual at the company who's going to administer their small business subcontracting program. Sometimes this person is called the su supplier diversity program manager. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's called the small business liaison officer. And the term in the regulations is the official who administers the subcontracting program. So there's quite a few titles, but if you were gonna Google a company, I would probably tend towards the words supplier diversity or small business liaison. And then plan is gonna talk about what good faith efforts they're gonna to take to ensure that anybody that they used when they named in their proposal or plan to use in their proposal that actually did end up getting a subcontract award. And they're going to assure that they're going to pay their subcontractors on time in accordance with the T's and C's of the contract. Next slide. So once we have these subcontracting plans in place across the country, our SBA CMRs go out and conduct periodic reviews to determine whether the prime contractors are in compliance with these plans, not only whether they're achieving their goals or not, but also whether they're achieving the other 14 elements that are in their subcontracting plan. Um, we work closely with the agencies uh, with regards to goal accomplishment. And even though SBA, an independent agency, goes out and does compliance reviews of these prime contractors, that doesn't mean that the contractors are not responsible to their own federal agency contracting officer with regards to compliance of their subcontracting plan. Our CMOs also monitor questions sent to our general email box, which is subcontracting at sba.gov. So if you ever had a question about subcontracting, go ahead and take advantage of that email site and you'll get an immediate response. Uh, we also provide education and training to agencies and large prime contractors with regards to subcontracting plan requirements and compliance. Um, the program is outlined in FAR, um, in, in, uh, adapting it and complying it at a prime contractor's uh, uh, company is not always easy. Uh, they have to change their policies and practices to incorporate small businesses in everything that they do with regards to federal contracting and using small businesses, which includes, you know, getting management on board, making sure the buyers are away, they're, they're trained, uh, making sure that everything is flowed down properly in the terms and conditions of the subcontract. So those are the kind of things that we go out and uh, do the compliance review on, but also things that we provide training on. And uh, the last thing, of course, is the directory of CMRs, which I, I gave to you earlier. But if you uh, forget their names and you want to check them out, there's a link there that does go uh, to our directory of CMRs. And we Next do slide. have a couple of questions. Uh, oh. Will these slides be made available to everyone? Uh, uh, Stephanie, if you will allow us, we can uh, post the presentation on the Ohio Business Matchmaker website and then the Ohio University PTAC website afterwards. Sure. Okay. Sure. It's fine with me. Then, sure. Um, another question is how do you locate primes that have won new contracts and are working on current contracts? Okay. Great. So that, that answer is coming up in just a little bit. Okay. Next slide. Great. Um, so not a little bit right now. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> how can a small business find subcontracting opportunities? And this is what we want to focus on today because we want to direct you to places where you can find subcontracting opportunities to bid on, uh, start developing relationships with prime contractors that might lead to future work. Um, so like I said, uh, it's not an easy navigation process. It's not as easy as doing business directly with the federal government. The federal government has websites where um, they advertise all solicitations and awards. So that's easy to find. But once the prime contractor has the contract, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to navigate into the prime contractor's facility and get a subcontract award. Of course, many, many companies do it. And here's the things that we recommend for, for you. 
Um, a lot of them publish on their own website a directory of who their prime contractors are. So if you uh, go directly uh, to the agency's website, um, the DOD uses the term OSDBU, um, Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. So if you were to Google DOD OSDBU, you'll go to their website and then you can find their directory of federal prime contractors. Not all federal agencies have that listing on their website, but many do. And SBA also has a listing as well of um, prime contractors on our website. And we have another question. Uh, sometimes I see SBA subnet subcontracting opportunities on SAM.gov. How can I get my company to be listed the same way on SAM? It doesn't okay. really work that way. Yeah. No, it doesn't, but we're getting to that too. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about subnet for a little bit. Oh, it's right here on the slide. So um, just going along on this slide, bullet two, another thing that they can do is they can research prime contractors recently awarded in, in beta.sam.gov. So if you're interested in a particular industry, um, you can look at those awards and prime contractors that have recently received awards in that industry and then approach them for subcontracting opportunities. Um, you can reach out to your local PTAC. Uh, a lot of them have low cost bid matching services and data mining workshops that show you how to find subcontracting opportunities. And a lot of them host uh, prime contractor small business matchmaking events. I know here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we have many of those that are hosted by our PTAC. And um, fourth on the list is to use SBA subnet website. And then fifth is to attend procurement fairs. So there's a lot of procurement fairs that are hosted uh, where the large businesses have a table and there's like hundreds of them in a room sometimes. And you would just simply walk around and market your business to any prime contractor that you're interested in doing business with. Um, next slide. We're going to go through some of these a little bit closer now. So this is an illustration of a federal agency that has a listing of prime contractors on their website. So this is the Social Security Administration, and this is their prime contractor directory. So you can see here that they have uh, the, the contract number that uh, the first one there is FedCap Rehab Services. So FedCap. Uh, we can't hear you now. Uh, you, you seem to you seem to be muted. There you go. Did that, did that help? Oh, that was yep. very weird. It said yep. to press all A, and I guess it worked, huh? Okay, very good. Um, okay, so let me just start over then. This is the Social Security Administration, and this is an illustration of a federal agency that does post their prime contractor directory on online. And um, you can see here that um, the first one in line there, FedCap, has won a contract with the Social Security Administration. And you can see the contract number, and then you can see the point of contact, and you can see what it was for, custodial services. So if you are in janitorial services or janitorial supplies in New York, you may want to contact Amy Reisner in order to market your business selling that type of thing to uh, FedCap for them to complete their work uh, with the Social Security Administration. So that's how you could use the directories. Uh, a lot of times they have email addresses and phone numbers there, so it's readily available for you to reach out to that company. And you could even mention, you know, if you're chasing a particular contract, you can use the contract number um, in your email and let them know you're interested in, a, in that specific opportunity. The one thing I kind of want to point out is how prime contractors find small businesses varies. Um, certain, types of certain types of prime contractors have to find all of their subcontractors up front even before they submit their own proposal. So uh, that happens a lot with like architectural and engineering contracts, uh, construction, those kinds of things, uh, facilities management. A lot of times they're gonna use the names of their subcontractors in their proposal to enhance their own work in order to win. So they're doing a lot of upfront work, finding their subcontractors that they plan to use throughout performance of the contract. 
And so in those types of interested, that's like a relationship building thing. You'd have to reach out to that company, find out about upcoming jobs that they're planning to submit offers on, and then try to team with them uh, to be a part of that proposal with them. We have other prime contractors that are looking for uh, small business subcontractors at all times um, throughout performance. We have different types of subcontracting plans. Um, one of the types is called a commercial plan. That means that they are looking for subcontractors both for their federal work and their commercial work. And a lot of those types of companies tend to be uh, the utilities, the airlines, uh, pharmaceutical companies, those kinds of things. It means that they provide a product to the government, which is the same product that they provide to the public. And so they're constantly seeking out small businesses to be subcontractors for that line of work. So it's important that when you market your business to a prime contractor, you sort of know which category you fall into because you're either you're either contacting them for future work to be a part of a proposal, an important team member on the contract, like you're going to perform a specific function under the contract, or you're a company that uh, can do business with a lot of different businesses. So you may just be marketing them to do businesses at any time. One thing that you might want to do when you contact a prime contractor is ask them how they purchase that item and how often, because a lot of them have longer term contracts with some businesses, such as five years uh, for where they competed a contract, chose a contractor, and now there's a five-year contract in place or a three-year contract. So if you're at the very beginning, if they're at the very beginning of that contract, that contract is not going to be available to you for the remainder of that period. So it might be helpful for your business just to move on to find other customers during that time, you know, and mark that date down and circle back with that prime contractor when the, when the expiration of that draws near. Uh, next slide. This is a page out of SBA subnet system. Uh, subnet is a posting website that prime contractors can use to post current subcontracting opportunities. This is kind of small, but feel free to you know, Google SBA subnet and it'll take you right to our system. It's a free posting system that they use and you can find immediate opportunities. And so what it does is it lists the solicitation number, the business, where their place of performance is, the intended start date, the NAICS code, a little bit about what they're looking for, and then the point of contact information. So as you browse through Subnet, if you find subcontracting opportunities that you're interested in, you should reach out directly to the buyer that's listed on the Subnet page and, uh, and work with them to figure out how you can submit an offer for that subcontract. Um, we've had Subnet for quite a few years. Uh, Subnet is heavily used in the construction industry. And not only will you find federal subcontracting opportunities in Subnet, we also allow uh, contractors to post non-federal opportunities, um, city, state, local government work as well in Subnet. Um, we're working to clean up Subnet. Subnet, um, Unfortunately, a lot of small businesses found Subnet and misunderstood what it was and posted something in there about their own business, promoting their own business. We're working on cleaning those out of there so that when you go in Subnet, you just find pure subcontracting opportunities that are ready today for you to look at. And this is probably the best website that you can find for live subcontracting opportunities for which if you qualify, you could, you could present a proposal or submit an offer immediately. Next website, next slide, I mean. <laughs> oh, this is just page two of Subnet. So if you click on one of the solicitations, you'll find much more detail about it. Um, in this particular instance, this prime contractor was looking specifically for veteran-owned and service-disabled veteran-owned subcontractors. Um, and it says when the uh, solicitation is going to close and a little bit about the description. This was for the California Highway Patrol, and they chose to also include a link, which is the invitation for bid to bid on the subcontract. Next slide. Um, PTEX are our resource partners. At SBA, the CMR's main job responsibility is doing compliance reviews and providing training. Um, we don't do a lot of counseling to small businesses. We really rely upon our PTAC resource partners to do that. Um, they have a lot of experience in counseling and in, in finding federal subcontracting opportunities and a lot of other uh, subjects. 
Um, some of the useful training materials that we have found, like um, this is on their PTAC website. It's a workshop called Data Mining. And it's a workshop where they go through how to find procurement opportunities how on the web, what to click on and how to navigate towards them. So there is a lot of uh, helpfulness that the PTAC can provide you. I encourage you to have a relationship with your local PTAC. They, like I mentioned on a previous slide, they do a lot of different things. They do workshops, they do one-on-one -on -one counseling. They work with the prime contractors in the area and a lot of time have matchmaking events. Um, we work closely with the PTACs and uh, we rely upon them. Next slide. Oh, I did want to mention also that PTACs, almost all of their services are free. Uh, they're partially funded by the Department of Defense and other, um, other companies and uh, organizations. And so almost everything that they do is free. There is some things that they charge just a very low cost for, like a workshop or a bid matching service. Um, also, if you're interested in a particular prime contractor, please go directly to their website to find out how to do business uh, with them directly. Um, also, before you contact a prime contractor to do business with them, we encourage you to go to and explore that prime contractor's website to find out more about the prime contractor and how you can fit in their procurement cycle. Um, this is Lockheed Martin's website. Uh, we have a big Lockheed Martin here where I am in Fort Worth. Uh, we have Lockheed Martin Aeronautics who builds the Joint Strike Fighters. So uh, they uh, use a lot of small business subcontractors. And a lot of prime contractors have curtailed their website to be user friendly for small businesses wanting to do business with them. And a lot of times you have to register in their portal. And while that's cumbersome, and we do hear complaints from small businesses that, you know, really primes, they just make us register in their portal and we never hear from them. And it just takes a lot of time. We just can't register in everybody's portal. But, you know, this is the way that they've set up within their company, how to find um, businesses that want to do business with them. And uh, remember that the portal is used by the buyers. So like at Lockheed, they have hundreds of buyers at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. And so just contacting the SBLO uh, isn't as effective as registering in their portal because the buyers are accessing the portal every time that they're wanting to purchase something. They go to the portal to see what suppliers are there. So while it may seem cumbersome and may not produce produce an immediate subcontract over time, it could produce, you know, a lucrative subcontract for your business. And they also, uh, this one, Lockheed also um, lists their outreach events that they're going to be at. So if you want to meet them in person, you could chase them down at one of the outreach events that they're going to attend. And then there's other useful information. A lot of times they'll have on there what their minimum quality standards are or how to how to reach the business. But you know, normally when you're gonna do business with a prime contractor, the, your normal first person that you're gonna to talk to is the company's small business liaison officer or supplier diversity professional, whatever the title is that they use. And while you're speaking with that individual, we encourage you to try to get them to drill down to tell you how to best do business with their, with their business. Is there a particular buyer that buys everything in your commodity? And if so, could you have that buyer's phone number and contact information, et cetera. Um, their position there is to recommend how you approach their company um, for doing subcontracting with them. And I know that you'll hear a lot more information today from those primes that we have here on this workshop on how to do business with their business. Next slide. And we have a couple of questions. One that I missed from earlier. Um, I've had zero luck in getting replies from primes, not even a thank you for contacting us. What's the best way to market and get in front of those primes? Yeah, yeah, we do hear that sometimes. And that's, that's something we crack down on. And so I encourage you first to go to their website and find out how they want you to contact them because they they may say it on their website. So then they just don't take phone calls. And, and I remember talking to Lucky Martin when that joint strike fighter contract was first awarded, they were receiving 300 calls a day from businesses. And so when a prime does receive a large contract like that, it, it is uh, overwhelming and there's no way to control and respond to everyone. So I would either, if you have a particular prime in mind, like you're specifically chasing a company that you know would be a good customer for you and that you can do a lot of great work for, 
Try different avenues towards approaching that company. Um, try to meet them at a trade fair. Try to get in a matchmaking where they're going to be present. Look at their website. Uh, try to find if they have any subcontracting opportunities in subnet, things like that. And just keep trying, yeah, persistence. Trying. Yeah, because yeah, they, and I'm sure our prime contractor panelists uh, will have uh, also uh, other best practices for reaching them as well. Um, I did have a comment. This is for our PTEX. Uh, there's a, 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 a participant who's looking for the, the Louisiana PTAC office. I put uh, the national aptacus.org website. Can one of you check and make sure that that is right? And if it's not, put the right uh, aptac US. It might be HTTPS. I'm not sure. But uh, if yeah, that Bill, okay. I, I sent her a direct message with the direct link for Louisiana PTAC. That's because you're a rock star. Uh, <laughs> Thank okay. you. You and are you too. Can, if you can double check that AppTAC website, if I made it, if it's right or not, I'd appreciate it. And then we I also should, have yeah. uh, Stephanie, um, one more uh, question. Uh, does the how to do business with Lockheed apply to most other companies as well? You know, uh, this how to do business with Lockheed page, um, I would say that this is common amongst the largest prime contractors in the United States, the, the Raytheons, uh, the Lockheeds, the Northrop's, the, you know, um, those types of companies, the large DOD contractors, they have um, extremely proficient small business programs, usually with multiple people, and they have to find a website, you know, that is very good. If you're going to do business with the companies that have may, maybe one or two prime contracts and uh, federal contracting is just not their primary business, you probably won't find something like this on their website. But I don't want to discourage you from chasing after the smaller prime contractors that you find in those directories, because a lot of times it's the smaller prime contractors where you do find the opportunities because they're new to federal contracting, they're new to having to find small businesses. And they are putting forth a lot of effort immediately to find small businesses and integrate them into their company. Okay, so this last page is uh, just tips, tips for marketing. Um, I explained the first one uh, earlier about how some of them are looking for subcontractors early to submit with their proposal packages and others are, are, are continuous. Uh, first and foremost, when you contact them, we encourage you to emphasize your company's skills and expertise. Just don't start with the, I'm a service disabled veteran owned small business and I want to do business with your company. And, and I think that you should because you have a subcontracting plan. That's kind of not the approach that you probably want to take. If you could start out with your skills and your expertise and how you can benefit them as a prime contractor. Uh, and then mention somewhere in the conversation, oh, yes, I, I wanted to let you know I'm also a woman owned small business, uh, something like that. Um, self certification for primes, they're looking for your business size because ultimately they're going to count you in a category towards their goal that we mentioned earlier. So they are going to ask you at some point to represent your size. They're either going to get it through SAM or they're going to present to you a self certification form. It's either written certification or it could be through some electronic portal that they use where you're gonna to have to certify that you are a small business under certain NAICS codes with that company. Um, to be small, you have to be small for the NAICS code of the work that you're performing for that company. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, they're able to count you in all the categories that you qualify for. So if you're more than just small, they'll be able to count you in some of their socioeconomic goal categories as well. And I think that's my last slide. So if anybody has any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, one more. Yeah, just a reminder, if you have questions about subcontracting, go ahead and reach out to us through our email portal there. Okay, uh, if anyone has any questions for Stephanie, uh, please write it into the chat. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we will have a copy of the slides available on the Ohio Business Matchmaker website. And Stephanie mentioned the importance of uh, matchmaking events. Now we're having our most important one in less than a month. So uh, if you haven't registered for the Ohio Business Matchmaker, it's $35 uh, and we're up to uh, 18, 27 or 28 primes uh, and government suppliers right now. 
So uh, you can see, oh, Audrey's already registered, thank you. Uh, you can see uh, the list of uh, the buyers and, uh, I'm sorry, the government representatives and buyers. Uh, and we're hopeful that uh, our panelists can also participate. Uh, are the buyers on this list in Ohio or nationwide? Um, most of them are in Ohio, uh, but our prime contractors today are uh, all over the country. Uh, because it's a virtual event, if you're available to participate, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. Oh, where do I find more information about HubZone? Uh, just email me. I'm going to put my email in the chat. I'll talk to you more than you've ever wanted to know about HubZone. Uh, <laughs> but you can also go to sba.gov. Uh, and then, uh, don't, I don't even know what I just wrote. That is embarrassing. That is not my email address. It's close. Uh, I can't do two things at once. <laughs> uh, go to sba.gov and then type HubZone into the search box. And it will give you uh, the basics for the program. Okay, uh, Stephanie, I don't see any other questions coming through right now. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. It's great to meet you virtually. Uh, and we will go ahead and turn it back over to Deborah. All right, Jill. Yes, Stephanie, thank you so much for that great presentation about subcontracting. A lot of great information and links to information that will be handy for the small businesses. Okay, next we'll proceed to our list of large business prime contractors. And as Stephanie stated, other than small business, that's how they're identified sometimes. So what I will do next is I will introduce the panelists um, and then I will turn it over to them individually to provide their presentations. So we have with us today, um, Ms. Helena Hutton from Cummins Incorporated. She is the Director of Global Diversity and Procurement. And if I have that wrong, Helena will be able to clear that title when she comes on. And we also have Ms. Susan Pugsley. Uh, she's with Eagle, Eagle Picture Technology, and she's a Small Business Liaison Officer. And we have with us also Ms. Christina Murdoch with American Electric Power, and she is the category manager. And lastly, we have Ms. Janine McMillan, who's a small business liaison officer for Rolls Royce. And so now I will turn it over to Cummins. Helena? Hi, can you go to the next slide, please? Can you hear me? Great. Well, thank you everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Helena Hutton. I'm the senior director with Cummins. We call our group the Center of Excellence. And uh, it's a center of excellence within strategic purchasing. Our strategic purchasing is a global organization and, um, and it's one that facilitates all of the purchases that Cummins makes. So today I'm happy to go through our organization. And I'm gonna give you a perspective on how we function and some of the programs that we have to give you a sense of our approach to sourcing, which complements um, you know, the foundation that you're getting from the SBA. Uh, with respect to my background, uh, I've been with Cummins now seven years. I started with Cummins as a senior attorney. I came down from Chicago as in-house counsel with another company and uh, transitioned to this role. And this is, it's been a pleasure to work in this role to build a program where we can include all kinds of businesses in our purchasing and in our products. So it's been a lot of fun. So now currently I lead the program globally. I'm also vice chairman of the Billion Dollar Roundtable, um, which counts, for example, veterans towards the membership requirements of companies. So the work that the SBA is doing and the small businesses and the veterans and other classifications are critical to uh, many companies' success that are in the Billion Dollar Roundtable, including Cummins. And then finally, kind of on the side, what I've also done is I'm of counsel with a law firm. And so I continue to practice law and support companies that often don't have access to experienced attorneys. And a lot of that work um, has been instrumental in helping companies you know, succeed. So I kind of have a tripartite approach to um, this area and finding ways to help others. Okay, so today on my presentation, we're just gonna go through three areas. 
um, which are you know introduction to how we're structured, how we measure, and then kind of a little bit what's different about our program. So next slide. So this is how we're structured at Cummins. We have about 14 people on our team and it's based, as I said, it's, it's uh, global. And so we have uh, myself, I sit on the purchasing leadership team, and then we have uh, key people on our team that deal with marketing and communications and compliance. That's Stacy on the left. We have an individual we just hired for programming because um, we've had some transition. And then we have on the right, um, my chief of staff and strategy. And then if you look down, we have different staff that's involved in each area of the business. So we have, we're structured by categories. Um, just to give you more background, I think many of you know, but may not, behind me is one of our engines. Um, we make engines and we power uh, trucks, we power buildings, we make generators. And so our categories are organized in relation to how we purchase goods and services in support of our products that we sell to our customers. Our customers are primarily um, the government, US government, South African government, you know, and then other governments depending on the country, but then also the OEMs. Uh, and so that's how we kind of uh, are structured and that's who our customers are. We also have our team has representation in China, India, Latin America, EME, Australia, and Africa. So together this team works to um, identify, sustain and help build relationships with uh, diverse companies that have products and services that complement ours. Next slide. So this is just a snapshot of where we uh, have operations and where we have the strongest really horsepower with respect to working with diverse owned companies. For, for the purposes of this call, it's really just important to focus on the US. So next slide. And this is just an example of the billion dollar roundtable and the companies in which we partner and which are also looking for companies like yours. So it's just a kind of a, just a reminder that there's a lot of companies that are looking for small businesses and SBA classified uh, businesses to help them with their products and services and help them succeed in their mission to have a holistic, healthy supply chain. Next slide. This is an example of um, an index that we created. And we created this because um, I think I saw even in the chat, people are talking about um, trying to reach primes and trying to get to them and we can't get to them and they're not responding. Um, and so I wanted just to give you kind of a sense of Cummins, where Cummins is, um, but also of other companies and how big they are, but also how they're, how they're doing. And so Cummins actually, we don't list the companies, but Cummins is the top one. And this was for 2020, where we were at 20 billion in revenue. Our diverse spend in billions was 1.6. This is obviously during the pandemic. And then our global revenue was uh, 8%. And we show this to show we're like one of the smallest companies in a group of uh, lots of larger companies, um, which I think Stephanie talked about some big companies like Lockheed Martin and others um, that are doing really great things. But for our size, we're actually delivering you know, huge results. And so we can only do this because of the people that are passionate in the countries that I showed you in the categories, and then also on my team. Um, it's certainly a collective effort and we're certainly looking forward to meeting as many companies as we can that have products and services that complement you know, what we're seeking. Uh, next slide. So before I go into the differentiators, what I wanted to highlight is I highlighted the categories. And on our website, we have the categories in which we're looking for suppliers. So our approach is that we're always trying to communicate uh, to the public and to businesses what we're looking for. And I find often um, that lots of companies will reach out and, and they're not services that we need and we're not looking for. And they could be the best company ever, but if it's not something we need, then unfortunately it's not gonna go anywhere. Whether they register in our portal where we do an RFI, RFQ, or try to build the relationship. So we try to be very focused and strategic on reaching out to those companies and publishing the areas where we're looking for suppliers. And that way it's efficient for all of you and it's efficient for us because we know that you have time and you have to decide you know, which companies you're gonna seek to build that relationship. So next slide. This is an example of, um, for example, in 2020, and I can share what we're doing in 2021 too, of what we're doing and, and continue to do to make sure that we're reaching out. So we do webinars um, monthly with our suppliers. So that approach is, and that's diverse and non-diverse. So that would be the SBA group and non-SBA. And so the goal is to be transparent. 
So as you all know what's happening with us, then you can plan and adapt um, your business models or your business planning uh, to be consistent. And as you know, during this time, we're still adapting to all the changing you know, environmental and political um, environmental changes. So we're just trying to share with all of our uh, suppliers so that they can understand where we are and what our needs are. Um, and this slide just shows some of the examples of programs. So the Backstage Pass is one that I want to highlight here. The Backstage Pass is a program that we have where it's a podcast. And so what we did was, we know, especially during the pandemic, we can't always meet with everyone. And, and when we say that we're looking for companies that meet our needs or have the technology or services that are compatible, we know you're not going to know that unless we tell you. So what we started to do was a podcast series. And so, for example, there's one with one of our leaders of new technologies, Mike Kirsch. He talks about what he's looking for, what our challenges are, and what our um, hopes are in finding companies, and even Cummins' vision and mission uh, towards having better products and services. So I, I wanted to highlight that, for example, so that you understand that we're putting information out there um, so that you understand where we're going, what we're, what we're looking for, you know, and what we're trying to achieve and looking for partners. And you don't have to just try to guess all the time. Um, or just go to our website. So we have our website that shows the categories. We have podcast series. We have monthly webinars for suppliers. And then on the slide also, we have a listing of, uh, for the Billion Dollar Roundtable, we've hosted different sessions with other companies where we have the chief procurement officers or other leaders talk about, again, what they're looking for, where the opportunities are, so that you know where to plan. And what we find is a lot of companies are able then to adjust their models to adjust as we're adjusting, because we find if they don't know how we're adjusting, then they're not, they become obsolete, the services, or they become in, in areas such as janitorial services or loan staff services. They're so inundated. And so uh, there's so many companies that it's hard to kind of differentiate yourself or even get noticed because they're already embedded in the um, corporate supply chains. So next slide. And we do have a question. Um, and for the most part, we'll save our questions for the panels section of the presentation, but does uh, Cummins keep a pool of subs through pre-qualification? So because we've been building engines for over a hundred years, we have different companies that are already partnered with Cummins and that are qualified. They meet the requirements for um, certain certifications that we require for our products, um, quality and et cetera. So we generally for our, on the direct manufacturing side, we already have uh, a pool of companies that are already partnering with us were engines that are already out in the market. Um, so the opportunity often is in the areas where we're doing prototypes or we're changing engines or changing uh, energy uh, that we're creating. And so that's why I wanted to highlight in this next slide, if you see Mike Kirsch is my colleague and his, his podcast is the one that I mentioned where he talks about new products and new technologies. So we're working really hard to try to communicate kind of where we're going, what our needs are, so that where there's an opportunity, for example, you have a new technology, and that's not something that's, um, that's something where you have opportunities, right? Because it's new, and it's not something that's related to, you know, an engine that's just getting variations from over 100 years or a generator. So often the opportunities on the direct side relate to the prototypes. We find it's a big investment because you don't always know if that engine will be launched and a customer will buy it. But if it does, then you kind of strike gold for years to come. So there's opportunities and certainly risks um, in going on the direct side. On the indirect side, with respect to services um, such as, let's say, janitorial facilities or uh, legal services or other services, often, um, I think, as Stephanie pointed out, the, the key is to do um, to offer as a tier two. Um, because generally, you know, we've consolidated our supply chain. So when we pick a supplier, it's somebody that can be uh, national at a minimum. Um, and so then this example on the slide that talks about our virtual trade mission, we find that we've helped companies go global. So if our supply chain requires support in multiple countries, like let's say Mexico and Canada now, then we help them and they go with us to then secure their um, footing there and then build a customer base starting with us. So this is an example of something that we do to help our, our uh, suppliers grow. And we have a trade mission coming up in South Africa and, um, and some other countries. And so we're helping some of our suppliers grow to match our footprint. Next slide. This is an example of something we did recently is we sold a business to a black manufacturer here in, in Indiana. 
and it's in a hub zone. And so we're excited about some of the work we're doing because we're not only just meeting with companies and we have a supplier development program where we put people in the program, we give them um, mentors and sponsors and help them you know, with our investment, but we also create suppliers and create businesses. And so this is an example of one that we created um, this year and that we're excited about it and excited to share. And we hope others will you know, use this company and business uh, because they actually make face masks. And it's an Indiana American made uh, manufacturer. Next slide. So that's kind of an overview. I just wanted to give folks a sense of what Cummins is doing. Uh, we have opportunities on the indirect side and the direct side, uh, but uh, we want to make sure you understand what types of opportunities we're looking for. On November 9th, we're actually partnering with the Indiana SBA office and some other partners to have Matchmaker and an overview of more in-depth information about Cummins, what we're looking for, what's our current strategy, what's our state of business. So uh, we'll send that information out if anyone would like to join us. That's coming up really soon. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Helena, for that presentation, um, Cummins. Uh, Cummins is doing great things. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question for you. I don't know if you mentioned it or not. And of course, we, have, we will have additional questions um, after everyone has briefed. Um, does Cummins have a centralized or virtualized uh, purchasing system? Is it decentralized or is it centralized? Or it's both? centralized because our categories okay. are global and centralized. So everything is centralized. OK, great. No, thank, thank you. you. The question. Okay, I don't think we're going to have any additional questions at this moment. Um, like Jill stated, we will address all of the questions that are coming in in the chat after everyone has presented. So again, thank you, Helena. Next, we will have a presentation from Ms. Susan Pugsley. And I think Susan had a, um, a PDF file, Jill. Can you hear me good? Yes. 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 Uh, Susan, okay. I don't have a PDF for you. I'm sorry. I have one for Rolls Royce. Oh, you don't? Okay. I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. We can hear you, Susan. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to be really brief, um, but first of all, I wanted to say that everything that Stephanie Lewis said is a great, um, great information. And she really laid it out how the process works for uh, large businesses and, and the subcontracting plans and how um, suppliers should uh, work on, you know, getting business with large businesses or other than small businesses. Um, but, Regarding Eagle Pitcher, um, Eagle Pitcher is the number one provider of thermal battery systems. We supply power for over 90% of the U.S. military's munitions and mission critical systems. And see, you know, that's some of the um, weapons that we've helped make the battery for. Um, our world headquarters are in Missouri, and we have other locations in Rhode Island, Kansas, and Canada. Um, we are famous for a few things, and we like to joke around here that we're the most famous company that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> but um, we made um, the variety of batteries that supplied um, power for nearly every phase of the Perseverance mission. And so that includes that cool rover that is going around on Mars. Um, our silver zinc batteries provided electrical power for the life support and guidance control systems after the fuel cell failed on the Apollo 13 landing. And um, so you could say we were the star of that movie. Um, and our batteries for the Hubble telescope outlasted the projected life, projected life by 14 years. Um, so we've done some interesting things. Um, mostly we make uh, uh, batteries for a lot of missiles and weapons. Uh, we also have a prime contract for that joint strike fighter. So. Um, and regarding our small business program, we, we have a, currently have a very strong small business program rated as very good, which is kind of a hard rating to get by our most recent DCMA audit. Uh, historically, we subcontract over 60% to small businesses. That's our total small business category. 
which includes all the socioeconomic subcategories. Um, we do struggle to reach our goals for hub zones, small disadvantaged business, and service disabled veterans. Uh, he feels um, somewhere a little better, but I think that. Oh. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, and I, I think we got oh, okay. that muted, hopefully. Okay. Um, and, and so we're always looking for uh, qualified suppliers in those categories. Um, we're also often looking for, cat, for suppliers that, um, for, that are qualified machine shops and that um, make electronic connectors, which we call headers. It's actually a um, hermetic seal for our thermal batteries. Um, and due to the nature of our business and the volatility of batteries, um, for these high-powered batteries, we require very high-quality standards for component parts. But in addition to component parts, we're constantly looking to increase small and disadvantaged business in our indirect and overhead spend. And that's it for me. Thank you, Susan. Um, that was a great presentation. I've done some work with you and uh, in your hub zone ploy, trying to find those small businesses that can assist you and um, the SBA appreciates that. So now we will move on to our next presenter and that would be Ms. Christina Murdoch with American Electric Power. She is the category manager. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Deborah. Um, like she said, I'm Christina Murdoch. So I'm the category manager at American Electric Power. I currently support telecom. Um, AP is not limited to that um, by any means, though. We are, as the title suggests, broken up into categories. And uh, they vary from needing labor. HR and professional services, um, IT, telecom, cyber, carrier services, general services, um, fleet transportation, construction, water, enabling, um, energy efficiency specialist. Um, there's a wide range of services that, that we need and we're always looking for vendors um, to work for us. So, we have tier one and tier two programs. Um, we certainly encourage a company smaller to register through AEP's website, just aep.com um, and go to the supplier section and you can register your company. So that way you get visibility to the entire enterprise. So um, we can find new and small companies that we had previously not known about. So we can try and get you into the program and, and get you working on jobs for us. Um, but we understand that it is difficult for smaller companies to sometimes get their foot in the door and have competitive pricing. So that's when our tier two program, um, we like to engage that to encourage the growth and, and visibility for the smaller companies. We have our tier one vendors report on their tier two spending. So your smaller diverse companies that your tier ones and your primes use for services as well. Um, that's particularly helpful in the IT space where it is primarily larger companies, but all of the smaller businesses providing services throughout, you know, off janitorial services and manufacturing and machining. There's so much that can be captured through that program. Um, it's, it's been a great win for us. But again, we highly encourage everyone to go to AEP now and register your company, but then also self-certify yourself. I, I've heard a few of our presenters mention that as well. And, and it's a very seamless process that gets you that visibility and um, it, it provides awareness to the different sellers within the company of who we can use and, um, and help to develop. But that being said, you know, it's, it's best to also build your network, um, have the conversations, reach out and, and speak to people 
out in the field where you start to build those connections and we can encourage that growth and development. Um, but you can also register on Ariba, which gains visibility as well. Our bids are all private, they're not publicly posted, but having your name out there in our systems allows us to know what type of services the small businesses provide so we can build our vendor pool and, and include additional folks on the... Uh, Christina, can you give us a website in the chat? In the chat? Uh, your mic has been in and out. I mean, I, we can hear 90%, I'd say, of what you've been saying, but uh, you mentioned Ariba. Okay, you just put that in there. Okay, and then like uh, Ariba, is that a separate website? You can find it all through that link right there. There's um, radio buttons throughout where you can, can link to everything. Um, so we have our AAP recognized diverse business classifications, minority owned, woman owned, veteran owned, service disabled, veterans, LGBT, um, hub zone certified and disadvantaged businesses. So we try and capture as much as we possibly can um, to, to build that experience level and, and find those programs as vendors who can provide services that would build our network. So essentially the link you put in there is the starting point uh, for AAP, AEP supplier diversity and then all of the information you've been giving. Yep, you can, you can register yourself as a vendor in our pool um, so we can search you throughout our systems internally. When we're ready to go to bed, we're looking for a specialized service um, that, that we don't currently know how to fill. And then that way we can speak to, to our peers throughout the, the company outside of our own category and, and talk things through and, and decide how we can grow and develop and one of the, the issues that we've faced is a lot of our small businesses that we've previously done business with have grown too large where they're not currently categorized as small anymore. So we need to, to continue to grow that pool and provide those opportunities. Yeah, so hopefully that, that at least gives everyone a starting point and Happy to answer any further questions. This is definitely short and sweet. We're cutting out a little bit. We'll turn it back over. Um, yeah, Christina, yeah, your, your uh, connection is going in and out, but um, we will have more questions um, um, just from the panel, from the moderator and probably some other uh, participants that are on the, on the call as well. But again, thank you so much. And um, now we will have our final panelist present, presenter, and that is Ms. Janine McMillan. Janine is a small business liaison officer for Rolls Royce. Janine. Thanks, Deb. You're welcome. Do you want to advance the next slide? Jill. Jill, are you there? Yes, my mouse oh. has walked away. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought I had lost connection. Sorry. Nope, you're good. Let's okay. see here. I don't, this is, I'm, let me mute myself while I make noise. I know the okay. mouse is right here. I am so sorry, Janine. This is. That's okay. If it won't advance, I can talk through it. You may have to scroll down. Um, yeah, go ahead and get started. I yeah. know this is like the dumbest thing. Um, okay, let me pull it up on, okay. So before we had our panel discussion today, I thought it was best that um, I just level set everybody that's on the call today, because I don't know if some of the participants are newer, small businesses trying to do business with the company, but I, at first I thought it would be best just to talk through who we are as Rolls Royce. So, um, so who are we? So we provide power. So as you see on that first slide there, um, 
we say that we pioneer power. So we're one of the world's largest um, global power groups. So people think of Rolls Royce and they think of the vehicle. Um, so if you didn't know, um, here's the big secret. We haven't made a car in almost 50 years. So we provide power that matters. So we don't say that we're an engine manufacturer. We say we provide power that connects people, power, and we protect society. So you can scroll to the next slide. So, so what do we do? We make some pretty cool cutting edge technology, um, very innovative. Um, I think when businesses, particularly small businesses wanna do business with Rolls Royce, once they figure out that we don't manufacture our cars, then the next question is, okay, what do you really do? So again, we power things um, and we provide and are required to meet high quality standards. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, it's tough to do business with Rolls Royce. Um, we don't, like I said, we don't make vehicles. So if there's a quality issue, you can't pull us off to the side of the road. Um, we meet FAA standards, um, Federal Aviation Administration standards, as well as other um, very strict um, quality standards. So um, understand who we are and what we do. Um, I think there's, this is a very condensed uh, slide deck but I would always encourage you to go visit us on our website at um, www.rolls-royce.com. Next slide, please. So where are we? Who, who are we about? So um, I've been at Rolls-Royce for 20 years. I think one of the greatest things that Rolls-Royce has to offer um, are our employees. So there's over 48,000 of us and we are in 45 countries. Um, what's cool about Rolls Royce is we try to be just as diverse and inclusive with our people as we are with our supply chain. So you'll see, um, which is another aha moment for some people, is that Rolls Royce is a British company. Um, you'll see that the majority of our headcount resides in the United Kingdom, um, then Germany, then the US and rest of world. So again, just trying to level set people in terms of um, where we are as our footprint when it comes to headcount and who we are as an organization. You can um, go to the next slide, please. So what really drives our business? Um, so we're big in civil aerospace um, and then defense. So I'm out of the Defense Indianapolis organization. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, 28% of our business is driven by defense. Um, I do also, or excuse me, yes, by defense. I do also represent that civil business as well and that civil aerospace. Our defense business represents both aero engines as well as marine. You can scroll to the next slide. So I do also wanna help people understand who we are as a business. So we have three major sectors. Um, I'm gonna focus most on the civil sector and the defense sectors. Um, power system is very much important, but I grew my career and I grew up within Rolls Royce on the civil and defense side. So as you can see that we have um, 35 different types of civil aircrafts and we have almost 12,000 engines in deployment. Um, and again, something to think about is when you're talking about Rolls Royce and now that some of you may are just learning that we don't build cars, you'll think, wow, only 35 types of aircraft and only 12,000 um, engines deployed around the world. For an aerospace company, that's a lot. So I think what's also important here is to understand what really drives us. Um, to an automotive manufacturer, for example, somebody's building cars, that's probably coming off of the assembly line every hour, right? Or something along those lines. In the aerospace business, our volumes are a lot lower. Same on the defense side, you'll see that um, we have about 150 customers um, and those are mostly military customers on the defense side. And then we have about 16,000 engines deployed. You can move on to the next slide. And so from the civil um, perspective, about 65% of our revenue is driven from that civil large engine. And then we go into that business aviation and that V2500. So a lot of people say, well, what's civil large engine? So the next time you're getting on um, a flight, um, you might wanna look on the nacelle. That's the, um, the sides of the, the aircraft on the wings that are actually holding the engines. And a lot of times you'll see the Rolls Royce logo. So no, you're not driving in a Rolls Royce, but you sure are flying in one or you're flying in, in, in a, a piece of machine that's powered by a Rolls Royce engine. So think of those um, much larger aircraft um, that's taking you across the waters when you're getting on the plane with your family to go visit family in other countries. Um, those are the types of engines that we um, power. Next slide. 
And then on the defense side, um, again, just giving you a little snapshot here about you know who we are. So most of our jets or most of the engines that we, uh, or planes that we power are transport. Um, then you see subs and then you see naval. So this was just a high level who we are. It's not a, a conclusive slide deck, but just wanting to give you a taste of who we are at Rolls-Royce, who I represent. Um, I think that's the last slide, but I did want to have a conversation about, you know, our small businesses and how we, we work with our small businesses. So we've been working with small businesses for many years. Um, some of our first um, engines have been in flight. Um, our, our earlier engines have been, been in flight since the 1950s. Um, what we do to engage small businesses is we have quarterly webinars. Um, I look at and I assess what's going on in the supply chain. Prior to being a, um, the small business liaison officer, I was one of the supply chain managers. Um, so I actually went into the field, met customers, met suppliers when we had issues. So what I try to do for small businesses is I hold uh, quarterly webinars with our subject matter experts that could be manufacturing engineers, it could be supply chain managers or quality guys. And we try to go after the topics that most of our suppliers are struggling with. Um, and um, again, in the civil and the defense aero um, business, as well as marine. Um, when you think about our business, how we're structured, we do have centralized purchasing or centralized procurement within each of those sectors. So civil has their centralized purchasing as does defense. Um, and our commodities are broken up by engine, right? So if you look at it, an aircraft engine, um, you'll see commodities like combustors and casings, you'll see the airfoils, you'll see the vanes, and that's how our procurement teams are split up. Um, we do have a indirect procurement organization. They too are split up by commodities. Um, all teams, whether you're direct or indirect, they are looking for the best value for money. They are looking to establish long-term relationships with some of our um, customers, long-term partnerships. Um, about 30% of our spend is in the small business or under the small business umbrella. We do struggle in some of our small business categories, particularly hub zone categories. That's, that's a pretty um, hard one um, to, to knock out. Um, do we have a supplier registration? We did many years ago and then we got rid of it. Um, I would say that we're still trying to evolve the best way for suppliers to engage us. Um, right now, suppliers um, find me, of course, on the government websites. And what I do is I connect the, the buyer or the commodity manager at Rolls-Royce with the supplier. Um, I'm trying to come back out again on our a corporate website with ways to connect by commodity. It can be complex. And I think as we've all seen with COVID, um, headcounts are changing, right? People are coming and going within the business. So it's just hard to maintain something like that. Um, what's my word of advice for small businesses? I would say um, be persistent and be patient. Um, depending on the type of organization that you're going after, especially Rolls Royce, I am a one woman show. Um, there is no organization. It is just me and I'm supported by the different commodity teams and executives. Um, so like I said, be patient, know the customers that you're going after, um, understand the commodities that are important to them and also the small business or what I also say is the historically underutilized business categories, right? Depending on who you're going after, um, maybe some of the government classifications aren't as relevant, but know that when you're coming to Rolls Royce or many other primes, we wanna hear, you know, yes, you may be an MBE, but are you also an SDB? You know, so understand that they don't translate across the, um, the different types of industries that you're working in. So I would say, um, understand that, that information is found in the FAR, in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. It's also on the um, SBA's website. And I would also say, um, make sure you understand the customer that you're going after. Again, so many people call us thinking we manufacture cars and we do not. Um, and then it's like, okay, now how do you fix that conversation? Because you were ready to go down a path and now we've changed it and positioned the conversation and you're not ready for it. So I would just say, make sure that you're prepared um, and then go exploring. I also encourage people to go to the Rolls Royce Global Supplier Portal and you can Google it. I don't need to have, I don't need to drop a link in, in the chat. 
Um, it's just called the Rolls-Royce Global Supplier Portal. There's all kinds of information out there on doing business with Rolls-Royce, what our expectations are. And then for direct suppliers, there's also a assessment out there um, that you could take so you can understand, you know, what does it really take to be a supplier of Rolls-Royce? I would also say, make sure you understand, you know, these new cybersecurity requirements. Um, we internally have had a lot of conversation with our small business suppliers, and we've actually partnered with some companies um, to help make sure that our small suppliers are ready for all that's to come with cybersecurity. Um, other than that, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions when we're on the um, panel portion of this conversation. But Janine, thank you so much for that um, presentation about Rolls Royce. Um, so that concludes the presentations from, from the individual um, large business primes and their responsibilities. So I think in listening to Janine's presentation, I think she answered probably most of the um, general questions that we had, but I'd like to ask one additional question for Rolls Royce. You mentioned um, that you have long-term contracts and, and yes, most of you do, but are any of those long-term contracts with any small businesses just in your history? Have you seen that? Oh yes, we have long-term contracts with all types of businesses. Um, some of them are foreign companies, right? Because we have some unusual commodities. Some of them are local small businesses. So it just depends um, on, the, on the type of commodity. So what I find is that a lot of supply chain organizations like Rolls-Royce, um, we're very lean. So we try to make sure that we're creating relationships and engaging in contracts that are beneficial to both Rolls-Royce and the supplier. And it's not something that we have to do on an annual basis. So when I say long-term, it may be three to five years, right? Um, some are 10 years um, based on the type of commodity, but some of our you know, heavier, more complex commodities, some of them are in 20 years. But yes, definitely there are contracts um, long-term agreements, three to five years with small business suppliers. Okay, um, thank you. So this next question is for all panelists. Um, do you feel that if a company provide you a capability statement, you know, from a small business, do you find that to be very, very useful in, in a marketing tool or should they, should the capability be specific to what you're looking for at that time? And if I need to clarify that, just let me know. So um, I'll let Susan go first and with the answer, and then we'll and then I'll call the next person. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Um, I do always appreciate uh, having a capability statement. If you're reaching out to me, it gives me something to look at first before I send it to a buyer and see if we're even in the ballpark of something we are actually looking for at the time. Um, also include your website link so that we don't have to go looking for you and your business size category because if I don't even know for sure you're a small business and I can't find you in Sam, maybe I won't be as likely to promote you if I have to go looking for that information. Okay, Helena. Uh, hi, yes, we do use them. I think for us it's, a good initial view of the company. We primarily look at the services. Often it's helpful to see what customers they already have. And then certifications and, and special, um, any kind of special credentials you know, that set them apart. Uh, and that's really a starting point because that's where we get a first look at what the company is, what they're offering. And then we can then contact other colleagues um, to share the information. Uh, going back to the second part of your question, it certainly depends on whether there's a, an opportunity at the time. So in some cases, it just may be a shot in the dark where we find a, a, a company and there's an opportunity at that time for us to put them in the RFI or RFQ. In other instances, it's just a great uh, introduction. We do put them in our, data, in our database and ask them to register so the information is accurate, but we also send them to the category leader so that they're aware of it. Um, the challenge, as you know, in life is just timing, though. So sometimes it could be the best company on the planet, but if we're not hiring for those services and there's no budget for it, unfortunately, there's not much we can do with it. Um, and I think going back to some of my colleagues' uh, comments on the panel, um, that's where building the relationships really matter. 
um, so that you can remember them that, you know, six months down the line when the opportunity does come up, um, then you remember them and, and certainly then um, put them forward again. Thank you, Helena. Um, next, we'll go to Christina. Christina, are you still here? I agree. Um, yeah, I am. I was muted. Apologies. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I feel like we have that commitment early on. We can be proactive and getting everything in the system and vetting these, these companies because AP has such a safety driven focus. There are a lot of work that goes into verifying your safety records and data, and that takes time. Um, oftentimes, I would say that if the opportunity is already here, it's too late because all the competitors are already in the system and they're vetted and they're ready to go. Um, so I would say, for a student early, like that way you can turn out there review it with the business units and what your capabilities are and, and how uh, Christina, I, I didn't hear the last part. Um, can you repeat that? Oh, yeah, um, I don't know what's going on. It shows that I am, um, my audio is going through, but um, I agree that we should have the statement early on so we can be proactive in onboarding the vendors and vetting all of their safety data and information because AEP is so safety driven. There's a lot that goes into um, collecting documentation from that perspective. And if we have information and capabilities early on, we can review it with business units and determine how broadly we can use the companies. So it's better to be proactive because oftentimes if the opportunity is already here, it's too late um, as the competitors who are also able to do the business are already vetted and ready to go. So I agree that we should have the statement early on. Okay, and lastly, Janine, I'll pose that question to you as well. Sure, I do think the, the statement is great along like with what Helena said with the certifications. Um, I'm an aerospace company, so I need to see your AS um, certifications and then any other relevant certifications. Um, if you're marketing towards our marine organization, they don't have those same requirements, but they still have certifications that are um, necessary to do business with them. Even in indirect purchasing, we'd like to see a minimum of ISO certification. So um, I think it is important that information I use, I send it on to the relevant buyer to help make the connection. Um, if we have to go hunting for it, um, it probably won't happen because we get so many hits um, daily from suppliers trying to get engaged with um, the different buyers within our organization. So does it matter? Yes. Um, to have your website out there, yes. Your certifications, yes. Any good information that can help us um, very quickly, because this is just a high level skim. Um, as the interest is sparked with, with the strategic team, then we pull in other parts of the organization to do more of a deep dive in your company. I um, mean, again, that's why I encourage you, whether it's you know Rolls Royce or Cummins or anybody else, I'm sure we have our quality standards um, listed on our website for people to check out in advance so they're not caught off guard. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jill, I see a few questions in the chat. Um, I can't see all of them. Uh, let me just... See if I could scroll up to. Okay. Um, uh, I see. I, I I see one here uh, that's for uh, Rolls Royce, I think. Um, but it's back to. I have an accounting bookkeeping business. Is this something usually done internally, uh, or have you seen contract opportunities for the sector as well? So usually that's something that we keep in house. Um, our professional services, that's kind of a tough one, right? Um, yeah, I, I have never, I have to be honest, I've never seen accounting and bookkeeping put out into the supply chain. We have a whole organization for that. Um, actually, within each of the business sectors, they have our own, their own individual organizations. 
but well, that doesn't mean the, no i mean part of it is for businesses to find out where there isn't a fit so yeah and helena it looks like you address that same topic uh that uh, we have a finance and accounting organization that manages our records this is not an area we typically seek providers uh, tier tier three suppliers may be seeking that type of service yeah i think they they may look for smaller companies like really small companies or startups that may be looking for accountants or those folks, but certainly in my experience, not the large corporations. Okay. Susan and um, Christina, would you guys like to answer that as well about that? Uh, I, I'd like to add about the cybersecurity issues related to accounting and um, and that would be a huge undertaking that if you were willing to do, you might find a, a, a smaller business so I would say Eagle Pitcher is on the very small side of large businesses, and we I don't even foresee any opportunity that we would subcontract something as important as our accounting records. Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah, it's yeah same for for American Electric Power as well. To my knowledge, it's all in house. Um, I don't believe that would go external. Okay, and I have a, a follow up question to that. So are there any subcontract trades that um, you compete regularly to establish basic audit agreements or blanket purchase agreements, um, such as travel, office supplies, janitor supplies, hardware, software, or anything that a small business could possibly participate? If I need to repeat the question, I, I will. I can share from Cummins perspective, we generally have three plus year contracts. So and as I shared, we're generally consolidated for national suppliers. So the opportunities would be tier two opportunities. Um, and so as smaller businesses come in, we send them to the tier ones that get the contracts um, to get to know them and then become part of that supply chain. But for smaller businesses, uh, we generally try to manage it from a you know, centralized perspective. Uh, and it would be for facilities, for example, um, you know, the janitorial, landscaping, some other things. And, and of course, some of it's changed with the pandemic because we're not in the office. I'm at home, for example. Uh, but there are still um, needs for different services like uh, janitorial and others. But the needs have kind of gone down because of the pandemic. Right. Susan? Um, yes, we uh, compete those, uh, most of those all the time. Um, I, we just went through a process of creating long-term purchasing agreements for many of those. So a lot of those have already been decided for the next few years. Um, I do think logistics is one area that, that we might be considering right now for long-term agreements. We have a couple more questions in the chat. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Um, do any of your companies offer contracting opportunities for trucking companies? Mm -hmm. uh, is this handled by, uh, or is this something handled by prime contractors? Um, for American Electric Power, I know that there are a few. It's not widely used as it's typically handled through the prime. So this would be um, a good tier two option. But it is not heard of for us. There, there are some, a, a little sprinkling of trucking companies that we do have. Cummins, that is an area of opportunity. So we outsource it to companies, Transplace and Millfield, that I would encourage you all to reach out to them because um, they're looking for, for uh, SBA classified companies and diverse owned companies. And we have uh, targets in our contracts. We have requirements in our contracts with them to meet the requirements. So those are two companies that we work with that are actively seeking trucking companies for us. What are, what are the names of those companies? And I'll put them in the chat. I can put them in the chat. Uh, hopefully I'll get the spelling right. Okay. Are there opportunities for sublimation printing services that provide apparel or custom products, coffee mugs, glassware, uh, promotional merchandise? So I can speak to Rolls Royce. So before the pandemic, yes, right? Um, now that the pandemic is hit because we actually had company stores at a couple of different locations. 
Um, now the pandemic has hit, the demand has gone down significantly. Um, so, so I think, you know, some of these commodities are just because of where we are today. Um, do, we, do we outsource trucking? Yep. Do we outsource some of these other, what I would call indirect? Yes. But depending on what it is, depending on the commodity, not so much in the pandemic. You know, we used to, when we used to have to go into the office, because for the most part, like I'm at home in one of my work offices, um, we just don't get out to the buildings as much anymore. We don't have as many customers come out anymore. Um, we used to have the company store manned on a regular basis, but the need just isn't there. So it, it, it just depends on what the commodity is. All right. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of different uh, commodity questions coming through. So uh, will the panel uh, working with small business, well, I think you might might need to rephrase that. Okay, uh, small business engineering firm in HubZone developing test measurement equipment for military and aerospace. So but I think they're saying, would you work with a HubZone company that specializes in developing test measurement equipment for the military and aerospace? So the quick answer would be yes for Rolls-Royce, but it depends if the demand is there, right? So what I would encourage that company to do, I can drop my email into the chat um, to see if we can get connected with the, um, the indirect com global commodity manager that managed that manage this test. Um, because like I think Helena, Helena, Helena said it, you know, if the demand is there, there's an opportunity. If not, not right now. And that's yeah, I agree. Then for Cummins, um, it would be our engineering teams as well. If I put my email address in the chat. So if you want to send, again, starting with your capability statement, which has your certifications and you know any special credentials, because as you know, this area requires them. Um, we can certainly you know speak to our engineering teams and and see what's possible. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I want to add too. I'll put my email address in the chat too. That is something that is a potential opportunity. Well, and also, thank you, Susan. Uh, I did see earlier in the chat, and I, I'm remembering now, uh, someone asked how to register for the Ohio Business Matchmaker. Uh, Jane or uh, Sharon, can you put the link to the matchmaker in there? And I know AEP is participating. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of the other panelists will be able to participate as well. Uh, it's on November 17th and 18th. and um, at that time, it, it, and really what I've learned from the panelists is, is the, the importance of, of signing up to become a supplier with their organization. I mean, it's, uh, as uh, Christina was alluding to, you can, the, that, that vendor page is used by the purchasing departments within those uh, organizations. So, I know that uh, uh, there can be a little bit of burnout in terms of, uh, of registering in SAM and registering with the state of Ohio, registering with all of these different places. But uh, uh, that is how, uh, that's how companies are able to find you. And then using the uh, SBA sub subnet um, to get started with subcontracting, I think is important because most firms that I work with have the ultimate goal of wanting to become a prime contractor. And one of the best ways to do that is to work as a sub first. So uh, Sharon, you put the Ohio Business Matchmaker uh, link there. And so again, it's $35 to register. Um, that's really just to encourage people to, to go. We find that when you have to pay even a nominal amount, you're more likely to attend. So uh, Deborah, I'll turn it back over to you. Sorry, I'm starting to ramble. No, that's okay, Jill. That, that's very important information because, you know, even though we have the panelists here virtually, then they'll be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with anyone that's specifically interested. But, you know, now that you mentioned subnet, I did want to pose a question to the panelists. Um, do any of you, I know you have general market researching um, tools that you use. So, do any of you use the SBA subcontracting network to publish your possibilities? And that means you don't really have a requirement at the moment, but it's forthcoming and or your requirements. Do you use the subnet? Anyone, um, we'll start with Janine. 
we don't use subnet. Um, we actually created our own tool. Um, and again, all of that is evolving again because buyers used it and then they stopped using it. So I'm always trying to figure out, okay, what's a different and creative way? Um, because out of that tool, we also did virtual matchmaking for the different opportunities. So um, today we don't unfortunately use subnet. Okay, uh, because a lot of small businesses may not have um, opportunities or have a direct link to your company. So we know that SBA subnet is very, um, is communicated with PTAX and everyone. So that's why, um, do you think there's a possibility that Rolls Royce may consider publishing any, any information in the subnet? We may, I'm not saying that we, we, we won't, we just don't do it today. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah. Susan, what about you? Uh, yes, I have used subnet and um, I do promote subnet internally when I see a potential opportunity. Um, and I, I'm glad that it's being encouraged here because I have not gotten a great response um, from suppliers through subnet. So I'm glad to see this being encouraged and maybe that will help <laughs> get the ball rolling. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Helena? Uh, I don't think we use it. I, I think as uh, we talked earlier, we spoke earlier, we pretty much know who the suppliers are when we got to bid for our products, you know, for the any of the engines or generators. So we generally don't use it. It doesn't mean we can't okay. explore it, but at this time, I don't believe we do. Right. As your CMR, we could probably talk a little bit more about that later in, in a different setting, just to see if we could possibly uh, come up with some ideas. Thank you. Um, Christina. Yeah, to my knowledge, we would use it. I, like, I personally have not, and maybe that's a takeaway for me to go back and talk with the rest of the team about um, our potential future use or experiences that others have had, um, but we do not, to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. As Stephanie mentioned in her presentation, that is something that the SBA is looking at, um, possibly revising that um, database, and hopefully we'll have more um, more efforts toward small, large businesses using it and small businesses going there to see what's available for them. So I have one final question. Um, it looks like we are we have about fifteen more minutes, but I do want to pose this question to the panelists. What is the single best piece of advice you can give a small business looking to do business with your company or other primes in Ohio or other primes in general? Um, Christina, you I can go. Say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say network. Um, get your name out there. Um, talk to people currently doing the work and Make yourself known, uh, promote yourself and, and your safety standards and your track record and what you do. Just really sell yourself, make sure that we know about you. Uh, you know, we can't use you if we don't know about you. So take the initiative, register, be, be the greasy wheel um, and, and just make yourself known and what your capabilities are. Okay, thank you, Helena. Let you go next. Uh, for us, I think uh, the opportunities relate to meeting our folks. So we, our folks are pretty open and interested in meeting people. And so that's why we have, I mentioned the November 9th event coming up where we're talking about what our needs are, technology direction, and then we have a matchmaker. This one is with the Indiana uh, region. Uh, happy to participate. I didn't know about the November, I think 11th one that you mentioned, um, but get to know us and, and show up. Um, and understand what we're looking for. We're happy to meet you. And Susan. I would say the single best piece of advice is to make sure you are registered in SAM.gov and with a concise and descriptive uh, statement that can be found on the SBA's dynamic small business search. Um, whenever I have a very specific um, uh, supplier type I'm looking for, that's the first place I go. And I, I think that's true for a lot of other supplier diversity professionals. 
and Janine? I would say I'm not in the, the Ohio area, but what I will say is that um, make sure you know the customer that you're going after. Um, make sure you understand what's important to them. For us, I would say visit the global supplier portal. Even though there's a login button there, you do not need to log in. Everything that you need to know about Rolls-Royce is accessible from the portal. Everything from our global conditions of purchase to our SABRE, S-A-B-R-E, that's um, basically our requirements to our supply chain. Um, and you'll see some information out there about cybersecurity. And I think you need to have a position on where you are with cybersecurity because the government is really pushing um, cybersecurity. So make sure you know what it is, what it's about and what the requirements are. Um, and then just be confident in your business and what you do. Um, I think somebody had already said and it may have been Jennifer Lewis from the SBA, don't start with, I'm a small disadvantaged business. At the end of the day, buyers have a lot that they're trying to manage um, because not only do we have these small business requirements, we have cost goals they're trying to meet, they're trying to meet delivery goals. So you have to really be ready to sell a solution. If you're coming with just your classifications, you've already lost that buyer because that buyer knows that they have other challenges they're trying to meet. Um, so it's a lot to balance, but, um, if you want to do business with any one of us, those are some of the things that you're going to have to, um, you know, learn how to manage. Um, and then just have your elevator speech. You're quick and succinct. This is who I am. This is what I do. And this is the solution that I can provide. Um, because you saw in my slides, Rolls-Royce provides solutions to our customers. So we're looking for those same type of solutions from our supply chain. Right. Thank you, Janine. Um, there's a question in the chat, Jill, so I'll, I'll take that as a follow-up to Subnet. So um, someone wants to know, if you don't use Subnet, where do you receive most of your suppliers from? Janine, you could take that now. So, okay, so I'll start with that. So a lot of our engines, I told you, have been flying since the 50s. So we have a lot of established supply chains, right? So for those commodities that don't have such established supply chains, um, those opportunities are usually coming from new product introduction. And it, it's from different activities that we go out to, whether it's myself, whether it's our engineering teams, whether or not it's our um, global commodity managers. Um, as we meet and matriculate, um, we get engaged with different suppliers. Um, people have contacts, right? Because sometimes, like Helena said, suppliers will reach out, but there is no immediate opportunity. We do still keep that information. Um, so for the established supply chains, we have an approved supplier list. Um, these suppliers have been properly vetted by Rolls-Royce, meet all the quality um, FAA standards, um, and we have invested in. And what I mean by that is, when we go to approve a supplier, we have to spend money. Um, so those suppliers and those relationships are going to last for a very long time. If we drop $2 million to get you um, certified, we're probably going to do business with you for a long time. For those commodities that don't have so complex requirements, um, it's just from you know being out and about and keeping suppliers' names or us going into the dynamic small business search engine. That is the search tool that I built within the organization. We have our own internal small business portal, and we have the Vet Biz, the small business um, or the dynamic small business search engine. So you. What I would recommend is that if you are not in those tools, if you're not registered, get registered because that's our first place that we're going to go if we can't find from the um, from from our own information. We'll go to the government tools. That's what they're there for. Okay, thank you, um, Helena. Uh, so for us, I, I really have just to reiterate everything that Janine said is really kind of the same process we have. But we talked about also the new product areas. You know, there's automation, there's you know, hybrid technology, there's areas where, as even Janine and others have said, that there's not uh, longstanding suppliers because it's new, you know, we're all inventing and trying to create new technology. So what I would suggest is that you promote, you know, those areas where you are great partners to these companies, because you know, certainly we need your um, we need your ideas and your innovation and we need your partnership. We have something that we do every year called Innovation Challenge, which we run ourselves to look for suppliers that have new areas of um, business or ideas or opportunities. Uh, we also have our supplier development program. So we do all kinds of things to try to attract suppliers 
uh, we generally don't pick loan staff, accounting, you know, some of the traditional areas. We really look for areas where it relates to our new products or services and areas where we can um, help you and you can help us. So I'd say look for those types of programs because then that sets you apart from just registering in a portal and getting lost in thousands and thousands of names. Great, thank you, Helena. Christina? So Deb, can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, because I know at Rolls-Royce, we, we have the SIPA program that we participate in. And I don't know, I know we didn't talk about it on this call, but maybe that's some good information to share as well, because we do for some very um, far-fetched technology is what I would call it, um, where there, it's a one-person organization, but they have a technology that they need to test in an aircraft engine. So we partner with them. So I don't know if it's worth also sharing information about the cyber programs or at least directing people to the SBIR. I know I'm saying cyber, but it's SBIR, the Small Business Innovative Research. I don't know how familiar people are with those programs that are on this call. Actually, Bye. we had an SBIR uh, webinar on uh, Wednesday. Okay. So, uh, and it's sbir.gov, I believe. I think so. And that, that webinar was recorded. Uh, thank you, Janine. Yes, that's actually good because uh, we did record it and it's going to be on the Ohio Business Matchmaker website and also on the OUPTAC website within the next week. Great. Thanks, Jill. Um, I believe we had Christina left on the subnet. Um, other than subnet, whether you receive most of your suppliers? Um, so much of it is is word of mouth. Um, you know, if I I can't tell you how often I have people from the business unit reaching out and they met somebody out in the field who works for a company that they've heard good things about. Um, I, I get a huge flow of requests um, to, to work on onboarding vendors from that nature. Um, but if, if it's somewhere where we really just don't have, where we have a big void, it, it's just market research, um, mm -hmm. just going out and asking around it and searching. I don't think there's one specific avenue that we tend to use most specifically. Um, so the power of networking, I, I know I said it earlier as well, but that really is, is a huge tool. Right, thank you. You know what, I'll just jump in and say one more thing to Christina's point about the networking. Um, I do call up my competition. <laughs> I know the SBLO at GE and I call her up if I'm looking for a, a type of supplier because our commodities are similar. So all of us on here have small business programs and we're here to help the small business community. So don't think, you know, is there some tree hugging and we're not sharing some suppliers? Yes, if it's that type of technology. I'm just being honest. However, we do talk amongst ourselves and there, it's nothing to receive an email from another SBLO saying, hey, Janine, I'm looking for this type of supplier. Do you know somebody? And we do share that contact's information. So we do talk amongst ourselves and do we do provide each other um, resources. That's a great point. We, we yes. do that at AEP as well. We yes. speak with other competing utilities. Good. Yeah, the SBA encouraged that, you know, um, similar industries to network and there may be small businesses that contacted you, you may not have the capability or the need at that moment, but another company may. So that's great networking and sharing best practices. We encourage that. I think there's a question uh, to Cummins. Does Cummins need hydrogen fuel testing sourcing? It's a question from the chat. Yeah, I responded with my to please send me the information. It sounds like it could be something of interest and we'd love to explore it. So please send me your information. Okay, thank you. Well, um, Jill, we have about four minutes. And I, again, I would like to thank the panelists for all this wealth of information and information sharing. And the SBA appreciates everything that you're doing to support the small business community and um, just keep doing what you're doing. And I look forward to speaking with you as your area for commercial market wrap. So thank you. Jill, I'll turn it back over to you. No, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for uh, participating today. And thank you to our participants for very good questions. 
Uh, we do have another webinar this afternoon at one o'clock on doing um, on uh, a uh, subcontracting panel uh, with small businesses, a so small business subcontracting panel. So uh, getting uh, government contracting from their perspective. Uh, so it, 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 it'll be an overall, uh, uh, a, the prime contractor perspective, then the small business perspective. So thank you again, everyone for participating. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, thank yous in the chat. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and uh, a great weekend. So thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, PTAC, Sharon, and Jane for all of your help today. You're welcome, Jill. Thank you. All right. All right, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Bye.